So welcome to Next Economy Conversations. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, this event series is co-hosted by the Center for Social Innovation and the Social Innovation Institute, and it's powered by FIX. FIX is the easiest way to plan, track, and optimize maintenance. They're the first open computerized maintenance system platform that mixes innovative technology with a focus on partnering with customers to help them organize assets, manage work, connect to business systems, and make data-driven decisions. More than 2,600 companies in over 90 countries trust FIX to help evaluate, buy, and implement maintenance software and simplify their journey to modern maintenance. As we said, this is our third event in a series called Next Economy Conversations, where you'll hear from where you will hear from incredible leaders who are helping to make the recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic, one that creates positive change and that builds the next economy, one that is sustainable, equitable, and prosperous for all. Each month, we invite a new guest to hear about their personal journeys, successes, and visions for the future. At CSI, we always start our events with an acknowledgement of the land, even when they're virtual events. So this, uh, this afternoon, we want to acknowledge that for those of us who are in Toronto, we're gathering on the traditional territory of the Huron-Wendat, the Haudenosaunee, the Seneca, and the Mississauga of the Credit First Nations. As we think and talk about social innovation, we are sometimes discussing a shared vision for a sustainable and just future. However, it's critical that we also reflect on the past and the present to consider how we can strive towards more inclusive, resilient communities that incorporate and respect many different ways of knowing and being. And as we, as we move our work and our lives into the digital realm, this also means considering how patterns of inequality can transcend into these spaces. So on that note, I want to share this quote from Alexander Dirksen on decolonizing digital spaces. Meaningful change begins with recognition of technological innovation as a fundamentally human endeavor. Behind the sleek glass and metal enclosures of our lithium charged lifelines are people with each line of code carrying with it all the complexities of human existence. Technology is not a neutral force, nor are digital spaces safe spaces for all, instead mirroring, replicating, and at times exacerbating the real and pressing realities faced by indigenous peoples and other marginalized communities in physical spaces. A social justice lens must therefore be applied to all that we discuss, design, and develop in the digital realm. So we encourage you to consider what it might look like in your work to apply a social justice lens, whether you're also hosting emergent conversations or if you're participating in them and shaping them. And without further ado, I'm delighted to introduce our guest and our host for Next Economy Conversations today. Our guest today is Kasha Hook. Kasha leads B Lab Canada, the nonprofit behind the B Corp certification. B Corporations are for profit businesses verified by an independent third party to hold higher environmental and social impact standards. Through accountability and transparency, these companies are working to create a more inclusive and regenerative economy. Prior to B Lab, Kasha worked across the private and nonprofit sector, working with the B Corp company, uh, the UN Agency for Migration, and the the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe. Kasha will be in conversation today with our CEO at the Center for Social Innovation, Tanya Sermon. Tanya is fueled by her belief in the power of collaboration and belonging. So Tanya, I'll hand it over to you to share a little bit, to, to share a bit about what we mean by the next economy and to get the conversation started. Thank you, Zoya, as always, so elegant and graceful in your introduction. Thank you. And Kasha, welcome. I'm so delighted to have you here. And in keeping with uh, the introduction that um, Zoya offered to us, just a, a little bit about what we're trying to do at the Center for Social Innovation in terms of building the next economy. Um, you know, we believe that everybody has a role in being a part of the solution. And uh, one of the things that's so exciting about being able to interview you here today, Kasha, is that we have the opportunity, uh, although CSI itself is a not-for-profit organization, we have the opportunity to really dig into what the corporate sector, what the business sector can do to be a part of that solution. And certainly, uh, when we look at um, what's been happening with this global pandemic, I think there's a lot of agreement that we have um, an opportunity uh, with this great pause, if you will, to think deeply 
about what's important, what does success look like, and how do we position caring and looking after ourselves, each other, and the planet uh, as a central in how we build it back better. So I'm, um, I'm certainly I'm just delighted. And I, just for the audience who are there, I've, my first two guests I, I actually knew quite well, and Kasha I just met today. So it'll be uh, an opportunity for us to get to know you a little bit better. So Kasha, just tell us, before we jump into some of the B Corp stuff, How's COVID going for you? Uh, how have you been coping and how are you feeling? And have you been busier or less busy? And just give us a sense of uh, how things have been going the last few months. For sure. Thank you so much, Tanya. It's great to meet you too. I was really excited for this conversation. Um, I, I've been relatively well. Um, COVID for me has just meant isolating at home uh, in Toronto. So I've been very fortunate to have a space to myself and not have to be dealing with uh, like toddlers or roommates or things like that. So I've been very privileged in that regard. Um, I think what it opened up for me was space to reflect. Um, so I was really grateful for that. Um, we were quite busy throughout the COVID um, pandemic. Uh, I'm saying that as if it's past tense, obviously it's still happening. Um, but, but the community um, really rallied together and obviously supporting businesses. We had uh, companies that were going through a boom and companies that were really suffering and just struggling for survival. And so um, we sort of took a pause from a lot of our other priorities and just refocused the team directly on supporting the community. And I think that was really um, powerful in terms of being able to clear my plate and just focus on um, what these businesses that we're working with really need at this point. Um, but I think generally what it's brought up for me is just how everything is, is interconnected within the system. So um, we can't talk about COVID without talking about the effects that it has had on the most marginalized communities among us. And I think um, what was really powerful, especially with the racial justice movement that's um, had such a groundswell over the past few months is in seeing this kind of shift in power away from like traditional, you know, um, like powerful voices towards the individual actions of millions of people showing up and millions of people using their voice. And it's forced me to kind of reframe those power structures um, and, and what our role is within that. I think B-Lab always thinks of itself as a small nonprofit that's working in sort of a niche space of um, supporting companies that want to do better. Um, and yet as a small organization, like we've seen such an upsurge in interest from the business community over the past few months. And so it's, for me, it's shown like there is this need for the work that we're doing it's so interconnected in the outcomes that we want to see and that I want to see personally in terms of aligning to my own values and the reasons why I was drawn into this work in the first place. Um, and also kind of how do we move away from a space of listening and reflection and education um, towards action and towards responsible action. So um, I think there has been a lot of good intention, but I think now with that shift of power, what it's bringing up for me is, is an optimism around where we could possibly go from here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I lost you just for a second. <laughs> just, you know, where we can build. You know, I, I think it, it's, uh, I, I think we're going to be really good friends now, Kasha, because that's exactly right how I'm feeling too. I feel like Mother Nature sent us to our rooms uh, to think about what we'd done to her on a timeout, you know, and, uh, and now there's this groundswell in, in different parts of our, um, uh, in, in the mainstream. People are going, oh, you know, what, what now? Um, and it's exciting and also a little bit scary because I think a lot of us are moving out of the education into like, okay, now it's now, you know, like, uh, you know, where, what is it actually going to look like? So how did you, how did you get to be this smart? What was your journey to get you to be able to be thinking in this way? Tell us a little bit about uh, where you come from and, and, and what your journey has been. Yeah, I started out in, I, I think I've always had an interest in social justice. So I started out um, studying international relations and languages and, and policies. So I was focused on regional policies in my um, master's degree. And that focus was in human rights and access to migration rights. Um, and what was really for me kind of like the impetus was that it, it just felt like there was this balance in the system that we needed to address in terms of who had access to rights through a passport or through birth and like how that whole system worked. So I got really interested in that. I worked um, for the UN Agency for Migration for a few years and I was mostly working on 
um, things like human trafficking and human smuggling, as well as um, more recently, I spent a couple of years working in um, direct assistance for uh, failed asylum seekers. Um, and that was in Toronto. So I was working um, with people who had applied for refugee status and been denied. And it was really fulfilling work in some ways. And then it was also really frustrating work in some ways because I was so frustrated with not being able to um, see any kind of systemic uh, change. Like I kept helping people and helping people uh, in, in like small ways, but helping people and hearing the same things. Like people were saying like, we just want to work. We just want to like have access to these opportunities. And what it came down to for me was that if we didn't address the things that were causing migration, um, like climate change, like economic inequities, we actually wouldn't get to a point where we would ever solve this issue. And so it um, forced me to think about kind of my role in that change and motivated me to work more in a systems level approach. And so that's why I left the nonprofit sector and I went into um, working with a for-profit and I worked with a marketing agency that was a B Corp. And that was a really intentional switch because I wanted to, um, I thought that business could really like use their, like leverage their power to be a, a force for good. And the way that we had been working was this sort of like, as in, you know, nonprofits and, and governments are, are creating these policies on one side to do good. And then businesses are doing the work that they wanna do and then donating some money towards those causes, but we're really seen as separate. And I kind of stumbled upon the B Corp movement as this place where businesses were actually seeing that differently. They were seeing that businesses could be engaged in addressing complex social and environmental issues through their business model. Um, so it really intrigued me. I, I landed at this B Corp. Um, I was really excited to work for a B Corp and just like get into that. And I was lucky that in terms of an agency, we were working primarily um, on with nonprofits or for-profits that were aligned to this, not sorry, I said primarily only with companies that are aligned to this ethos. Um, and then after a few years working with that agency, it felt to me like we were still doing one-off projects. And I think what drew me into the role at B Lab was the fact that we were doing um, sort of like at a, at a kind of more meta level, we were working with the businesses that were doing that work in all different kinds of ways. So it was, you know, um, a chance to work across different issue areas, but be able to have that systemic change. Um, beautiful, beautiful. And um, uh, I have a number of different questions, but I'm going to, I'm going to wait and just maybe what we should just do is establish just so that we've got it super clear. What is B Lab? And what are uh, B corporations? And just give us a little bit of the theory of change and how you would describe this movement uh, in the world. How big is it? And, and in, in Canada in particular. But let's just start with basics. What is, uh, what is a B corporation? Yeah, so I'll try and run through. I'm sure I can get through all, like, all of those answers in, in um, a, few, a few minutes. So B Lab is a nonprofit. We work with for-profit companies to help them use business. We say using business as a force for good. Um, I've also had recently using business as a force for change, which is really powerful. So we work in a few different areas. We work with companies themselves to help them achieve greater impact. And the way that we do that is through an assessment process. So we will, um, there's three kind of components to it. The first is that we will evaluate the, the way that they do business. They um, fill out an online assessment and it's pretty long. It's about 200 questions long. So it's, it goes quite in depth and it covers five different areas of the business. So it covers the way that the company is governed, uh, employees, community, um, environment, as well as customers. And so across those different pieces, we're taking a holistic look at the business and it helps us understand what the company is doing across all different um, areas of impact. And also for, the, for those companies that are taking the assessment, it gives them a roadmap of how to improve in those five different areas. Um, once we've gone through the assessment process, there's also a legal component and that's meant to establish accountability. So companies are, in Canada are required to change their articles of incorporation to say that when their directors are making decisions, they have a positive requirement to consider the, the, the um, benefits of a broader group of stakeholders. Traditionally, when we think about corporations, especially based on this kind of 1970s Milton Friedman um, piece around the purpose of a company is to pursue profit for, for its shareholders. Um, what B Corps are doing is saying, 
yes, we can pursue profits and we can also pursue, like we can also define what's for the best, for what's in the best interest of a company by thinking about different stakeholders. Because we know that if you're thinking about your profits over employees or profits over the well-being of your, your community, you might have this short-term interest in, you know, gaining profit that way. But over the long term, that's not going to be great for the community or your workers, etc. And so these are companies that are orienting to this um, new way of doing business. There is a legal accountability piece. There's also a transparency requirement. So we get companies to um, uh, share their score out of the 200 questions they get rated. They have to have at least a score of 80. Um, and most traditional companies will fall in, in line of around 40 or 50 points. So they have to get at least 80. So it's a really high bar that's set. And the reason around that is intentional. We want this to be a community of companies that are sort of aspirational for others to follow. So they, they are doing good. They're doing it in really intentional ways. Right now we have about 3,400 companies globally um, and about 285 in Canada. So it's a smaller group of companies. The, the movement is growing quite quickly, but it's a smaller group of companies that are meant to inspire this larger um, kind of movement among their consumers, among their investors, and among you know, the employees that they work with. And I think how that kind of maps into our theory of change is that we're doing this work to uh, help companies understand what it means to be better for business. We're also doing some of the policy work. So we have traditionally operated in this space, even in Canada, the law is a, a little bit different. And we do have a, a broader, we have kind of a permission that directors can uh, consider other stakeholders when they're making legal decisions but it doesn't require them to. So it, it is really open to interpretation. And I think um, what's important there is that we need to create sort of a policy that allows companies and encourages them to do business in a different way, but also protects them when they're doing that. And so B-Lab has, has been doing work to advocate for legal change in that space. Um, and then otherwise we're working um, with uh, partners to both in, in terms of kind of like subject matter expertise. So if we know that a whole slew of companies really need support on a specific impact area, usually we'll bring in a partner to support on that work um, as we're, we're quite a small nonprofit. So it's kind of like building that network of this idea of stakeholder capitalism as opposed to shareholder capitalism. Um, I think in Canada, like it, it's sort of a less known avenue for companies. Like I said, we're still less than 300 companies, so it's not a huge movement in Canada. But it is um, the, the second uh, country outside of the US that um, we started. And now globally, we're in 65 or 75 countries. So it's, it's grown really quickly. And I think Canada is kind of leading in that as a community. Um, and I see a ton of room for that because right now in Canada, as we're talking about what is important, what are our values, you know, as we're talking about with COVID, this great reset, what does that look like going forward? And I think B Corps can play a really substantial role then. Wow. Geez, you ask a question and you get it all. So I'm just going to recap for myself uh, sure. to say, so uh, the B Corp Lab or B Lab is the organization, the nonprofit that is then doing the accreditation process and supporting those people who um, are, are either attempting to become a B Corporation to set the bar of the way that we can embody stakeholder calling it stakeholder capitalism, is that what I heard? Yeah, stakeholder governance, stakeholder capitalism. Okay, so, so the, co the core of the theory of change is that in the accreditation, we're asking those businesses to consider all of their stakeholders in the process of, of operations. And mm -hmm. that the objective of the movement is to uh, spearhead and lead the way uh, about what corporations can do to demonstrate their role in making the world a better place. Did I get that? Yeah, you nailed it. Not bad, not bad. <laughs> okay. It's, uh, I mean, and, and B-Lab's been around for it's more than 10 years. How long, did, when did it start? In Canada, we've been around, um, I think for eight years now, uh, but globally, we just hit 14 years. Nice, nice. And I remember learning about the B-Lab and B-Corps um, you know, more than, uh, well, it was just in the U.S. and, and watching as it uh, came into, uh, into Canada. And there was such a fervor of, you know, for profits that were like, yes, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. And it sounded like from when I was chatting with people that there was a lot of stuff around governance, like you said, around transparency, around community engagement. And, um, but one of the questions I've always had about uh, B Corps is, is there any um, criteria that actually vets 
see the fundamental nature of the business. Yeah. Because it was like how you operate and you know what you can do for your staff and your stakeholders and so on. But like, what if they're doing resource extraction, but they operate beautifully? Like how do, how do you deal with something or like, you know, consuming products, you know, like in consumption, like how do you guys g- grapple with the fundamental nature of a, of a business? Yeah, for sure. It's tricky. And I think a lot of us are cynical that are in the space for good reason, because we do see companies that are, um, you know, they have great marketing and they're able to present themselves in one way. But as soon as you look under the hood, you're kind of like, hold on a second. Um, what we do at B-Lab is, um, I mean, it's a mix, it's a mix of different tactics or approaches, but um, generally our premise is that we work with companies in a positive manner. So we work with companies that they can improve over time. And we, as long as they meet that minimum threshold of 80 points, um, we know that they can make those, those changes to improve their impact even more and more over, as the years go by. And most companies do that. Most companies use it as this tool for improvement. Um, but then in order to restrict this to companies that are um, sort of aligned to the ethos of the movement, we do have a few things built in. So there is a disclosure questionnaire in the review process. When companies answer the online assessment, they go through a process where they meet one-on-one with an analyst from our team. And the analyst will review um, what they've said and check their documentation and they go really in depth. So it is quite a rigorous process. If you talk to anyone who's a VCOP, like it's not an easy process. Um, and the, the assessment is based on independent third party criteria. So we have a number of different independent councils that advise on the questions. And you can think of B-Lab as sort of the curator of that information that is then interfacing with businesses that want to do this work. And in the disclosure questionnaire, we will ask things like if you're in resource um, extraction or different controversial industries. And we have on our website, a list of the controversial industries where we have either decided we will not certify companies within or that they would need to go through additional criteria. Um, An example of that is um, like the for-profit education space. So we know that there's been so much controversy within that space. And so we've set um, additional standards that companies that operate in that space, because you will have companies that say, yes, this this has been, you know, an industry where there's been challenges, but we are trying to work within this industry to create change and we're doing it really well and this is how we're doing it. And so in certain industries, we have been open to it. Um, the fossil fuel industry is, is not one that we have been open to doing that on, but you can find the full list on our website. And I think what's really important is that we um, take that approach to understand more about a business and understand more about the space. And so there are some places where we will just kind of like put it off the table, but otherwise um, for most companies, it is enough of a high bar to go through and get those 80 points. And within the assessment itself, it's split into two different sections. So there's one section that, as you said, goes through the operational aspect of a company. So like, do they have a great recycling program? Um, What's the pay ratio between their highest paid employee and their lowest paid employee? Like all of those different operational aspects. And then there's also a section of the impact assessment called the impact business model. And that assesses how the company is intentionally designed to create beneficial outcomes. So you can think of it as, um, you know, if a company is collectively owned, then that is an intentional business structure that is designed to spread wealth across the structure of the business rather than sort of holding it at the top in a more traditional business sense. Um, that's one example. There are, there are, business, there are business models across um, the five different categories that we assess companies on. And we, as we update the assessment every three years, we're always kind of learning about new ones and adding them onto the assessment. The assessment, there's like over a hundred different versions of it. So companies will see one that's specific to the business size they're in, yeah, geography industry and all of that. But the impact business model is where that additional piece would come out. And, and we see the B impact assessment as a way to kind of nudge people towards those practices. So as they learn about them, as they're taking the assessment, as they're kind of planning out their roadmap, they can use it as an educational tool to move towards those pieces too. I love it. I love it. So uh, nonprofits, uh, they, they cannot apply for the B Corp. It's just not relevant to the B Corp. Is that correct? So we've been really specific about making this for for-profit businesses because we know there's already a lot of good being done in the nonprofit space and the government space. Um, so we don't intentionally um, structure this for nonprofits. I will say the online assessment that companies go through is uh, completely free and it's available online. So a lot of nonprofits will actually use it as a tool even though they can't 
go through and certify at the end of it, they're able to use it to track their improvements over time. So at B-Lab, we actually do that. So we go through the assessment ourselves every three years and we see how we're doing and we, we set our goals within the assessment and we work towards those goals. So it's been super helpful for us, even though we don't have kind of that logo to put on our website that we are certified. And that actually brings me to, I've got two or three questions. I've got them all at the same time, but like, what's the number one reason why a business would, would do this? Is it the logo? Is it the branding, the elevation of their company in the minds of the consumer? Is that the number one or is it like what motivates the desire to do this? Yeah, it's a good question. I think you'll get a different answer if you talk to, you know, any number of companies because the, it, it's so context specific. I think the legal piece has been a big one, like companies that want to operate in this way that are going through, um, you know, a change of management or a change of ownership really um, want a way to um, keep the uh, mission of the company in the DNA of the company. And there's that risk if you go through acquisition or, or growth that you might, be able, you might lose that. And so the legal framework is a really powerful way for companies to do that. And so for some companies, it's kind of the least sexy, but it's probably like one of the, the things that really draws people in um, or that they find as a benefit once they've actually certified. The other piece is, I mean, employee engagement, employee retention is huge. So not only being able to attract great employees, but being able to keep them. And I think being a B Corp, intrinsically like by doing those things within your company you're making your company a great place to work so that is attractive and what i've seen is that it's a great way to keep uh, employees like they, they really see themselves in it and see how you know if they want to make a change this is the way that we do it from you know working with companies that are already thinking this way um it's a way to um i think attract investors like there are impact investors that intentionally want to align with these kinds of companies but otherwise um for a more traditional investor, it just shows that a company has really done that diligence to have some of these really tough conversations from the get-go and understand what their company stands for and how their company operates. So the, the process is super rigorous. So it allows companies to show that they've done that work. Um, it is a way to differentiate from competitors. It is a way to sort of market your company. And you have this third party credible certification that's not just you know a marketing plan, but actually that if you want to see what our score is, you can go on, a, on the B-Lab website and see it. Like, so there is a bit of um, more rigor around the promises that you're making or the commitments that you're making. And I think that's really powerful for, for a lot of companies that are trying to differentiate, differentiate think, themselves. Has there ever been an assessment? Like, I mean, one of my, my own, you know, theories in my mind is that uh, a company or a nonprofit, a social purpose enterprise of any sort that adheres to these um, these types of accountabilities uh, are more profitable. Is that, do you think that there's any, do we know that or am I just making, cause I often make things up. So I'm just curious if there's any, if there's any evidence to suggest that there, that those businesses that uh, decide to put in place these kinds of stakeholder in, engagements, this, you know, governance and, uh, you know, and, and internal programs, uh, are they more profitable? Do we know against their competitors? Yeah. Um, so I haven't seen any data like specifically answering this question because the sample size is still really small. Like we're still only 3,400 companies across the globe. Um, there had been some studies that came out of the UK saying that um, because we're more likely to be profitable than uh, or more profitable than traditional businesses. We also um, have some anecdotal data. So for example, um, from a business uh, kind of case standpoint, Danone, um, which is a huge multinational based in Paris, they were able to negotiate a more um, sort of uh, with their creditors. They have 12 different banks um, that, that gave them credit. And across those loans, they were able to negotiate a better price for, um, the, for debt on B Corp portfolio companies. And so that's where banks like HSBC and other large traditional banks are actually giving them a um, better rate based on the way that their uh, ESG aligned brands are performing. Um, we also see that companies that are in this space are more resilient. So um, when there was the 2008 crash, we saw that businesses that were B Corps were more resilient, more likely to survive. And we've heard this from BDC too here in Canada, um, than companies that were more traditional. And I think that there's a number of things. Like I think I've also read I, I was actually just reading on this this morning, um, a study that was pretty non-scientific, but they were just comparing six companies, three who had more of a kind of 
stakeholder capitalist approach and three that didn't. And they said that there was just sort of a, a through line. So they couldn't say that there was benefit and they couldn't say that, that there was negative um, implications for it. Um, I think it comes out in different ways. So I think it comes out in there's better employer retention and there's, you know, better um, sort of dialogue with consumers. And so when there is something that hits like COVID, you already have a really solid team structure and you already have been thinking about these things. And so you're not sort of all of a sudden scrambling to think about what are your employee benefits because it's being tested at this point. Um, and so I would say like, I've yet to see data that points like in a really credible way across like a, a huge community that would, would be helpful. But I have seen that businesses in the space are more resilient and are able to navigate that better. So, so tell us an example of a Canadian B Corp that you think is awesome, that's hitting it out of the park and why. And then I want to hear one of one, one that might be a little bit more on the borderline of, um, of uh, you know, whether it's in or not and, and what that line is between, uh, you know, what's in and what's out. But give us, give us the big possible, like give us an example of one that you think is just doing great. Uh, it's impossible. There are so many great ones. Um, one locally that um, has been in the in press recently um, in Toronto Star, there was coverage over this a few weeks ago, um, Paintbox Bistro. They are a catering company and a cafe based in Regent Park here in Toronto. And they, um, you know, obviously as a company in the event space with the catering business and in the food space, they had to shut down um, pretty rapidly with COVID. And I was really impressed with the speed at which they did that. They sort of preemptively shut down before the um, city orders had come, come about because they were really concerned about their employees and they really wanted to create those protections. So they committed to um, you know, paying their employees for uh, ahead, of this, ahead of the outbreak and closing down the cafe. And it was, I think, just sort of a, like they were ready and they were sort of already oriented towards thinking about their, their employees as like, you know, a really important stakeholder in their business and committed to that. And then coming out of it, they have completely transformed their business. So they've become a, they've used their space to uh, do a number of things. Some of it is a food mod. So local communities can use it to get local, uh, groceries in the local area. Um, there's also delivery services for those that are not able to access the space. They've been using it. Um, I think upcoming, they'll have a pop-up space where local, um, you know, folks in the food industry can use their space to to host pop-ups. There's an ice cream store based out of there now. Like it's we, we we know we know this very very well because one of our staff, Denise, actually runs that very ice cream store in Park. Uh, so very uh, kudos to them and and they actually CSI Regent Park is right upstairs above Paintbox. So you amazing. kind of like very close to home. Oh, that's amazing. Have you got an example of one that might be like a, a more, um, I mean, that's a small business and they're so agile and, and I'm thinking about it, like, is there a, an example of a larger company that, you know, maybe, you know, over a hundred employees that you, that you see? Because sometimes I think it's easier to be values-based when, you know, the founder, owner, you know, and all of those things that they, they're doing in their business. But when it gets to like, you know, I remember in my own work, I remember the difference between being a a social entrepreneur and then having to become a CEO and there's mm -hmm. a different role and it's, it's not as much fun. I'm just going to tell you, it's just not as much fun as being a, a founder. So give us someone a, a bit bigger and, and what you look for in that. Yeah, for sure. Um, one that always comes to mind is Greystone Bakery. So they are a manufacturing facility. They make brownies. You probably have had them there in Ben and Jerry's ice cream. So they're a supplier to Ben and Jerry's. And one of the programs that they, um, that they kind of landed on, they realized that they had attrition. So in their uh, manufacturing staff and the, the employees that were on the bakery floor. Um, and so they wondered how they could address this. So one of the things, there's actually kind of like two really incredible programs that they put in place um, and that they've grown. Grayson Bakery put in an open hiring process. And what that means is that in their hiring, they don't discriminate based on the background of the individual. So it's really opened um, the doors to employees that have potentially previously faced homelessness or have been previously incarcerated and gives them a way into a stable career through um, this, this job and, and training on the job. And it's a model that's been replicated. So Body Shop just engaged with Grayson Bakery to learn about the model because they've um, you know, it's been so successful that they've created this foundation that shares um, what they're doing. There's also um, Rhino Foods, which is another bakery that have similarly thought about this and um, launched a income advance program. 
So it gives employees access to up to $1,000 within 24 hours, no questions asked. And for some employees, that can be the difference between, you know, spiraling back into debt, poverty, all of that, or, you know, being subjected to predatory lending systems um, to keeping their job and, you know, moving forward. And so um, by, they created this program um, where the money is, is paid back through the employee's paycheck over time. And once it's paid back, um, they, they continue to, you know, they can opt into this, but they continue to take um, the same amount from their paychecks and they build credit that way. And so for a lot of employees, this is actually the first time that they've been able to build credit in a positive way. Um, I talked to people who literally like had bought their first car. I talked to one, one guy who was the first person in his family to ever have purchased a house. And now he lived in it with his dad. Like it, so those kinds of like that kind of meaningful change, I think happens um, in thinking differently, like in any other world, it's just, you know, a, a company that needs employees and that needs um, this, this kind of like broad based of broad base of people to work in their, you know, manufacturing facility. What and was they, this in that company? This was Rhino Foods. Rhino Foods. Okay. And, right. Well, and so, and so with Rhino Foods or with Grayson, they've, they've seen like where can their impact be? And it's in the hiring process because they have all of these employees. And so if they make changes to the hiring process, they can actually benefit a lot of people. They saw increased increase retention. So at, at Grayson and Bakery, they went from 61% retention to 85% retention. So, you know, it's good for the business. And it's also um, just an incredible kind of life-changing job for the employees too. So I, I think that like in big businesses, they have, yes, they don't have as, as much ability to be as nimble, but they also have such a power in those different pieces of the operational businesses that, you know, it, it can create that change that too. Uh, you know, one of our uh, listeners um, uh, reminded me that Fix, our, our title sponsor is helping us all be here today, is actually a B Corp. Exactly. And I have to tell you, I just love Fix because I, the idea that we get to actually fix things that exist already and not have to actually buy something new, it's a lost art, I swear to God. And I'm, I'm always blown away by the amount of garbage just that ends up on the side of the street that all it needs is a little love. And, uh, and how do you bring that back into, um, uh, back into circulation? My mother and I have a, my mother does upholstery. I have the space. We're always finding old stuff on the side of the road and she's reupholstering it and getting it back to, uh, back in there. So it's, it's fun to watch. So uh, yeah, kudos to fix. And, you know, one of the thing, uh, the things that I'd love to know is, do you have, how many of the Sil Silicon Valley, the tech companies have gone this route? Do you have a sense of that? Yeah, I don't have a, a, a number off the top of my head, but um, Techstars are a big tech company. They are, um, they are a B Corp certified company. We also have seen, like, I think it's over $2 billion at this point in, of investment from traditional VC. Um, like one company that, you know, I said there are so many companies that come to mind. Fix is one of them too. Uh, I see Andrew's on the line from Ecotone, um, based at CSI too. They're great B Corp too. Um, Pila is a company based out west and they um, make um, uh, biodegradable like everyday products like cell phone cases and things like that and they just attracted five million dollars in VC funding from Jay-Z's company like so there it's it's we're seeing more and more I, I guess that's just more generally in in terms of the traditional like Silicon Valley like investors and tech companies um, all buds are a huge company. They, I think they were just valued at like 1.5 billion. So, uh, we had our second IPO this year from a, a B Corp and it was lemonade and it was the most successful IPO of 2020 so far. So like, it's been incredible to see, um, how this, you know, is coming from not just the, um, niche space of social enterprise or, you know, what we would think of maybe a niche space. And really it's an idea that like whose time has come, I think, and it's catching on in those more traditional sectors. Um, last year in the fall, we had the business roundtable, you know, CEOs of 181 um, top companies globally come out to say that businesses need to have a greater purpose than just profit. And so it is something that, you know, slowly and, and whether that's, you know, uh, something that's being said and what the commitment is around that. But it is it is great to see that slowly the conversation is changing that way. Yeah. I mean, there's so many different directions we can go with this, this conversation. And you know, one of the things that I love to, um, uh, I mean, I, I get so inspired by all of the businesses that are making change in the world. And um, I mean, I'm always blown away by the creativity and the innovation and, 
and um, but I but I still grapple with some of the core questions uh, uh, that I, and I you know I warned you about philosophy a little bit so you know some of the things that I've been grappling with is you know when is uh, when is our sort of bigger is better scaled approach to business actually antithetical to what we're doing you know I I've been really um, I really struggled as a as an entrepreneur to figure out this the sweet spot, and also to understand like what is profit and and you know from my perspective you know as a not for profit, <laughs> like we the the ONN the Ontario Nonprofit Network uh, talked about call it, renaming us the public benefit sector you know because the this idea that we're not for profit but we're an eight and a half million dollar a nonprofit with you know 60 staff and so we, we function as an enterprise but this question of profit where does the profits go and what is the profit motivation and do we require the profit motivation in business um, and and looking at this you know I've been uh, I'm all over cash I'm gonna get you the question I promise but this question for me about you know the number of sort of moving these values into the for-profit sector is it feels like maybe we're not actually addressing some of the, the kind of fundamentals of like what is motivating us to do this work. And I wonder if you've seen like what your own thoughts are on that. Like, you know, the nonprofit sector doesn't lack for, pro, uh, for passion. It doesn't lack for even revenues. We can, we can gener generate those things, but this profit motivation, which seems to completely consume us in the business field, you know, thoughts on, on what that's actually doing and, and whether you're seeing folks kind of walking away from that and looking at new models or anyway, just discuss. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate this. I try and bring up this conversation with my friends and my family and they're just like, they, they tune out. So I appreciate having this forum to talk with someone who's equally as passionate about it. Um, yeah, I do, I do see this space. I think one of the challenges is that we externalize the costs that businesses do. So right? we don't, yeah, so we don't actually think about, um, we don't you know, think about who, did, well, who had to pay to get us to this, this place of privilege that all of a sudden we get to create these things. It, it was it all us. Like, no, it took an entire society, an entire government system. And anyway, sorry, I should let you talk. Go ahead. <laughs> No, 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 exactly. I appreciate that passion. It, yeah, exactly. Like CSI, I think, put this in a newsletter a few weeks ago around the food system and how they've, they've shown, studies have shown in terms of water treatment and all of the, these like environmental uh, and addressing the environmental outcomes of the food industry that the government spends um, equal amounts of, to the food industry. So essentially, if we actually paid a fair price for our food, we'd be paying double what we pay. So our food is subsidized by the government in these ways that we, and, and charities is the same thing. Like we expect nonprofits and we expect governments to subsidize the, the work of more traditional for-profits in those, you know, in the, in the, the way that they pollute, in the way that they cause, um, you know, negative social outcomes for those employees that are underpaid or those employees that, you know, don't have the mental health benefits that would come with having a secure position and things like that. Um, and I think what we're seeing is this, demand for that to be rebalanced or to be balanced and you know if we think about the role of the company you know decades and decades ago before like not 50 years ago in terms of like the Milton Friedman um, positioning but back to I think of kind of the Rockefellers and I, I know that like no company is perfect but I think those types of companies did have this more um, community-based approach like they, they didn't think about the way that they operate outside of their community they thought about their employees as people and they thought about the ways that they could um, give back and maybe that was something that we consider now like more traditional in terms of community partnerships and and giving models where they you know create a certain percentage of profit and they donate that to a certain cause um, but it is really difficult to take a like you can't have a company that is working towards um, creating this benefit. Like we've seen it in the Black Lives Matter coverage. You have companies that are taking these state, these um, public stances around solidarity with the Black Lives Matter movement and also not addressing the fact that they are at times supporting um, political uh, PACs that 
like supporting these um, politicians even in funding them that actually support, you know, white supremacist ideas or um, ideas that are exclusionary to black people. And so this is being called out more and more, especially in more recent times and like, you know, with the racial justice movement, but it's a good example of how companies have been able to operate on one side, having some, you know, kind of like public stance, but on the other side, being still tied into these systems of oppression. Um, and I think, you know, what we're moving towards is how do we, how do we like reset that framework? And so, you know, it'd be love the way that we're, we're addressing that is through working w with businesses to establish this, um, you know, understanding of businesses can be a force for good and businesses can actually work to address those complex social and environmental issues. And they don't need to be sort of functioning on one side and externalizing those costs and then cleaning up the mess afterwards. But actually they could be like Pila um, creating these products that don't cause ocean waste in the first place. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, you're, we're, we got so many rich uh, conversations in there. And I think, you know, one of the things when you say Rockefeller and, you know, they were more community minded, they looked after their people, but they then took all of that insane wealth and introduced it into the market. And now they hoard that mm -hmm. huge amount of wealth that allows the rich to get richer, the poor remain poor, and we aren't looking at the fundamental redistribution of assets. And you take a look, take a look at the Black Lives Matter. I mean, ultimately, some of the fundamental challenges that we're facing, uh, it's not about the little bits and pieces. It's about a, a, a fundamental rethink and even getting our foundation sector to be willing to move from 3.5% giving to 5% giving. Uh, is is like a monumental undertaking. Well, where did those wealth, where did that wealth come from? On whose back was that wealth generated? And now the privileged are able to hold on to them. My God, I'm sounding like a. Well, no, my it's people will be, my people will be so sad. But I guess I'll just get to the point here, which is to say, you know, circularism which is, I think, you know, a circular economy is sort of a way of understanding, uh, creating a, uh, a full cost accounting mechanism. And there's a lot of depth in here. We'll be talking about it on a future show. But circularism suggests that you have a whole system that there isn't, uh, there isn't waste and there isn't exports that are going outside of the system, that we're actually designing economic systems and solutions which are circular and whole and include bless you. I can hear you sneezing, even though you can't. <laughs> and so, you know, it, it raises for me that a lot of the B Corp um, uh, stuff and the new legislation, the kicks and the, you know, L3Cs in the US and, and other things are really, you know, futzing around or playing around with the for profit model, and not really fundamentally looking at how we might shift the nonprofit and charitable model. And I'll just talk about, um, I'll just talk about, you know, the Center for Social Innovation as an example, because of course I know a thing or two about it. <laughs> you, you know, we've had to create three legal entities and at 1.5 in order to operate in two countries in order to just be able to serve. And the limitations on our ability to use revenue, which is ultimately just energy, in order to meet the needs of our community, uh, it's like banging our heads against the wall constantly. Uh, and so it's just interesting that we, we see these non, the for-profit sector being able to kind of like create these new models that introduce concepts which I think are really important, like st stakeholder uh, um, capitalism, which I want to come back to. But, but nowhere do we see the social mission sector, those folks who are like asset locked to serve community, right? Like that's the difference between a nonprofit and a for-profit is the nonprofits have an asset lock more or less. Uh, my lawyers would say, well, not quite, but mostly uh, that says any surpluses go back into serving the mission. Whereas in the for-profit sector, any surpluses have the opportunity to be issued as a dividend to the founders or to the owners and so on, which I totally understand as profit as a motivation for the founders. But I wonder if you've seen any organizations then, you know, when they exit, because you mentioned that earlier, when they exit, they then put those assets into a public trust or a community trust 
or they switch it from say a for-profit, which again, the agility of the founder, the entrepreneur in the early stages, the ability to figure out what the business model is, you need that flexibility, you need the capital, you need the investment. But at exit, might we be able to see some of these companies saying, you know what, this really needs to be a worker co-op, or it needs to be an ESOP, or we're ready to turn it into a community land trust. Have you seen any of that? Just because I want it. I want to see us moving from the entrepreneurial drive of passionate founders and, uh, that, that are coming from a place of values to be able to start to uh, shift it into something which is uh, serving in perpetuity, but in a more ethical ownership model, potentially. Yeah, for sure. I have seen it. Um, I have an example of a B Corp that, um, you know, at exit established a fund and it was specifically to benefit um, POC and women led organizations and businesses. And so there is that model. And I think what B Lab attempts to do is actually get in between like before that process where there is um, massive accumulation of wealth at the top of a company. And actually, like if we look at, I have a statistic from, from the US that um, the, the high, highest paid employee to lowest paid employee ratio, 144 to one. So the lowest paid employee makes, or the highest paid employee makes 144 times what the lowest paid employee makes in a company. And so one of the tools that we have through the BM Impact Assessment is to encourage folks to shorten that, you know, uh, minimize that ratio. So what's, most- what's typical, Yeah, go ahead. What's a typical B Corp ratio? Uh, I think it's one to nine. Mm -hmm. So most B Corps, um, you know, potentially they are like one to 25 or one to 50 and they will like work over time to increase the wages of the, um, the lowest paid employees so that are being paid a living wage. And we like encourage them to do those practices and also to redistribute, um, you know, the highest rate, like have that go into the company in different ways. And I think that is through programming. So like, you know, when we think about the short-term profit, we'll think about what is the direct return on investment for um, certain pieces of the company, but we're seeing companies that take that and invest in equipment that's more environmentally friendly for their manufacturing processes or you know, uh, employment supports like the program that gives employees um, access to advanced income, things like that. And so I think for me where, where our role is and I see what you mean in terms of the, like there needing to be that space between like you know allowing nonprofits that are you know charities like um you know something that's a direct beneficiary outcome like a, a a women's shelter for example to all the way to like these companies in between that want to be doing you know there are going to be traditional companies that are on the other side of that spectrum that are just operating like really blindly focused on what they're trying to do and, and to make those profits and I think where we fit in that spectrum is like t bringing companies that are potentially more traditional or companies that have intention to be operating in a different way, but don't quite know how closer to the model of more um, distributed uh, equity in a company and more, um, you know, beneficial environmental outcomes and then meeting sort of nonprofits in that space. And I think what we've seen like in a negative way is that the nonprofit space potentially doesn't attract entrepreneurs who like really want to um, build their business and grow and really believe in their mission. And they're looking for different ways that they can use the for-profit model to take the benefit that they want to do. And I think that's the space where Becos fit in where a lot of entrepreneurs come to us because they're, they feel hamstringed by the current um, legal avenues that are available to them as a, for, as a nonprofit or as a triple C company or as a CIC, like the, um, the benefit corporation model is sort of a direct way to address that by giving companies this kind of legal uh, infrastructure where they can operate with a purpose, but are also not limited in um, the asset, you know, like they're, they're not limited in the ways that a lot of nonprofits are. Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, Look, I, 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 I'm, I got my little bee, my little bee in my bonnet about, uh, about you know, the limitations of, of uh, charitable law and the not-for-profit law. But I, that does not take away from the extraordinary work of the B corporations and how far um, we're seeing this leadership. I mean, it, it's really inspiring. I, I want every company in Canada to be a B corp. I'd love every company in the world to be a B corp at least. And and I guess that sort of takes me to um, uh, my my one of my questions around, you know, what do do you anticipate? 
I mean, look, I think we are aligned, Kasha. We both want to use the power of markets for social impact, right? I think, and we're looking at where do we, how do we get this incredibly successful uh, capitalism to actually uh, hold and represent all of the stakeholders involved in the creation of a business solution. And so um, I guess I'd love you to, to hear your thoughts on, you know, we're in this, uh, I think we're aligned and wanting to rebuild an economy that puts people and planet first, you know, what does success look like for you at B Lab in terms of like, what's the, what do you think is the sort of uh, the, the pivot point or the, um, the tipping point in this field? Like, like you were super excited about the, you know, everybody's now paying attention to us. <laughs> it's like, so what do we do now? Like, what's the way that we max this out and really get us uh, over the top? If you could pick one policy change that you could uh, ask the government of Canada to implement, what would it be to help us rebuild this economy? Yeah, um, I mean, one piece of legislation, my apologies. <laughs> what did you say? Sorry, I missed that. Wrap you on that question. <laughs> no, that's okay. Um, one piece of legislation that did come out um, from the federal government in, uh, you know, when they were uh, announcing their stimulus dollars was the LEF funding, Lodge Enterprise. I forget what all the, what the whole acronym stands for, but it's the Lodge Enterprise Emergency Funding Fund or something like that. Financial yeah. fund, maybe something like that. LEFF. And it was um, meant for companies with 300 million in revenue plus. And it required, like it was similar to the benefit corporation legislation in that it required companies of that size to make commitments that aligned to Canada's uh, climate goals and mm. then report out on those every year. It also required them, one, one piece of benefit company legislation is that um, in some jurisdictions is that it requires the company to have sort of a director of impact on their board. So someone has to hold a, a position in that way. And similarly, the LEFF funding um, did require companies to allow a government sort of official to be part of the board um, in terms of aligning to the, the climate focus. And it was really meant to start companies that are in these massive industries to start to align to climate commitments and help Canada get to that point. We know that we can either have all small businesses across Canada, or all SMEs uh, aligning to the environmental goals. And if we get all the businesses involved, then we could meet our targets, or we could get a few of these larger companies to commit and, and make the same progress. And so the funding was really aligned to that. And I really welcomed that approach because it, what it did was call in these people who have an oversized, um, you know, influence on uh, climate degradation in terms of social impact. Like if we look at um, companies that are in the oil and gas sector, they have been tied to things like man camps that, you know, from the report last year on missing and murdered indigenous women and two spirit people, we know that that has an outsized effect on our indigenous communities. And so by calling in these um, larger companies, it was a way for uh, the government to sort of create policy around what the expectations were for improvement without requiring sort of a black and white, like you can't operate, you can't operate. It actually is like pulling companies in this direction. Um, and so that's kind of an incremental approach that I think is nonpartisan. It is still supporting business, but it is um, kind of facing the reality that these businesses will continue to operate, but saying like, how can we actually improve on the ways that they do that. Um, so, I mean, I think that would be a place to start. I don't know if that's the one, you know, like the one and only solution, but off the top well, of my head. I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna, I'd be really interested to know how mainstream uh, business would feel about simply adopting your stakeholder capitalist approach and the stakeholder shareholder agreements. Um, you know, one of the recommendations that I made to the federal government in my kind of off the cuff provocative kind of way was, you know, it's government's job to regulate. And if Larry Fink can get out and say, hey, business, we're not going to invest in you if you don't, um, if you don't uh, protect, protect your communities. Uh, if he can do that, are we not much more ready for us to implement in law and address the Milton Freeman's nightmarish, you know, profit only shareholder agreements. If we could change one thing, this is a it's an invitation and a question, like, how do you think they'd react? Are we ready for it? Which is like, why don't we just change the law? I mean, she says, 
But like, why don't we just <laughs> take the loss? Just do it. Have to actually consider all of the stakeholders in all of the decisions that they make. And we just put it in law. Somebody yeah. do it. like, could, what would happen? Would that, would it work? Could it work? I mean, especially if we had like at least, you know, the developed world do it. I think right now, I mean, coming back to that piece around externalized costs, businesses, um, like the, the cost of doing business in a way that doesn't externalize the impact of your work would be probably pretty jarring for, for a lot of people. Well, um, and then, and then the other piece is for me, like institutional investors. So until we have alignment from investors to say like, yes, we will support companies that are working in this way until we have a government that says like, yes, we're going to support businesses that are working in this way by, you know, not allowing companies that are the highest polluters to operate without financial restrictions on that and without responsibility for that. Um, then like putting the onus on business is tough. And at the same time, what we've seen in history is that policy generally lags behind uh, progressive action. So I think what we are seeing is that businesses that work this way are kind of proving out that this is a way for businesses to still succeed. Like, even though there is this, I think that's sort of this negative connotation that it's going to be more expensive, but as businesses are continuing to grow and to scale and to show that this is really a, a, a way to do business that is for the good of the community and for the good of the business too, we'll start to shift those perceptions. And then I think society will kind of follow along. And I think like for a lot of mainstream businesses, it's just like that it's difficult because it isn't the norm necessarily. So it can be difficult to find the resources to like even understand where to begin. Like you can be a really well-intentioned entrepreneur and not know that, you know, like you, you may not have the capacity to do a really diligent search in your supply chain and find suppliers that are diversely owned, for example. And so making it easier to do that kind of, um, like to, to do work in that way and just normalizing that as a way of doing business would be really helpful if policy could get us there, that'd be great. Yeah. I think we have to kind of like push all, push all the pieces together at the same well, time. And, and from, my, from my perspective, I agree a hundred percent. And, uh, and I, I just want more now faster. <laughs> because, mm -hmm. and I really want us to take advantage of this moment in time when people are actually paying attention so that we don't just build it back the way it was broken, but rather that we actually take what I think is a confluence of extraordinary forces and a moment in time to be able to make some radical asks and some radical invitations. Um, you know, and some of the things that I would love to see is I, I would love, I mean, look, I'm, I'm quite pleased with uh, the uh, federal government's decision to not just go back and, you know, prop up oil and gas, but actually to have that become an employment program to clean up the oil sands in Alberta. I thought that was brilliant. I love it. I think we need more green jobs, uh, but working with marginalized communities. How do we actually make the connection between the social realities that we're facing and the environmental realities? And, you know, too often, I think that the, um, we need to look at our deficits and our and and see how we remix these in new and creative ways. I'd love to see more and more of the B Corps actually, you know, leading the way in terms of those job. We're going to be seeing massive economic stimulus for the next three to five years, right? Like mm -hmm. what we're in and what we're facing right now is, I mean, our businesses are are uh, unfortunately many of them are simply wrapping up. They just can't continue in this. But you've got all this incredible talent, all of these incredible needs. I mean. The climate imperative is massive. And also we're seeing the caring imperative is massive. Those frontline workers who are most vulnerable, those people who are often of color and who don't have the same opportunities. Well, this is the magic moment to start looking at the relationship between, uh, and really looking at what government's role is in stimulating the right kind of economy. Because ultimately they're gonna be throwing money out the door one way or the other. They might as well be trying to solve uh, uh, they're already broken Kafka-esque, you know, uh, and, you know, one ministry, you know, has to pay for the work that wasn't done by the other ministry, so on and so forth. So anyway, here's hoping and asking, and, and uh, I have to say that the B Corps, I think you've succeeded. Um, uh, I think you've succeeded, Kasha, in providing us with a massively excellent, wonderful explanation of what B Corps are all about. And um, I know that from some of the comments on here, we see 
that CSI is proud to have many B Corps as a part of our community uh, and, and blown away by the extraordinary leadership that they play, uh, the, the inspiration that they provide, sometimes very small, sometimes larger organizations, but demonstrating time and time again that it is possible to mix markets and mission and, uh, and to make the world a better place through the power of these, of these tools. So I just want to say, um, I want to say a massive thank you, but I also want to say, can you tell us um, if one of our listeners was keen on learning more uh, and wanted to become a, a B Corp, what do they do? Yeah, for sure. I can tell you that. So um, the online assessment is the best place to start. It is at bcorporation.net. Um, if you click on certification, you'll find out all the information. And the first place to start is just taking the B Impact Assessment. It is that online questionnaire that I've mentioned. It's 200 questions. It's a great way to just go through and understand where your company sits right now. So you can take sort of an hour and just go through and answer the questions. Um, understand where you sit. And if, if it is something that is meaningful to you, I would encourage you to like continue to use the assessment as a way to make progress in your business. Um, you can find us online. We're at um, B Corporation on Instagram and on Twitter. Um, and we also have a Canadian account at B Corp Canada. Great. Uh, and so I want to thank you, but it's also my way of letting Zoya and Shay, who are going to ask some more questions, come in and ask some more questions. But yeah, actually, go ahead, Zoya. Let's let's take some questions from folks, and we'll see how it goes. Fantastic. We had lots of great questions come up, so we've condensed them a little bit um, so that we can try to get to as many as possible. Uh, so first question comes from Michael. So we've condensed a little bit. Um, given the long history and ongoing context of labor market inequities across Canada and the current focus on systematic and structural racism, one of the most powerful tools for equity and fairness is strong employment equity legislation frameworks. As we build back better from a social enterprise perspective, how do we move this policy objective forward for a fair, resilient, equitable economy? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, the way that I've seen it done in practice, um, I'll give you an example from a B Corp based in Alberta, um, Chandos Constructions, so they're one of the biggest general contractors in Canada. Um, they really intentionally have worked to do um, better environmental um, work. So they're, they're working on waste reduction on the construction side, things like that. Um, but where I've been really impressed with them on the social impact side is in their intentional hiring around um, indigenous women, um, different groups that have not traditionally been uh, represented in the construction sector, um, but that are um, obviously looking for employment. And so um, they've used their power as a large organization to create, um, you know, uh, positive employee hiring practices around that. But I think what's uh, even more incredible is the work that they've done um, with their influence to uh, focus on policies like procurement. So they have um, done a ton of work over the past year to uh, collaborate with their competitors and with others in the sector to push the government on procurement policies for other organizations that work with um, marginalized communities or underrepresented communities. And I think that's a really um, powerful way of how businesses can sort of shift the conversation around policy. What I hear from a lot of politicians is that, you know, they're just not hearing this demand or, you know, potentially they're not seeing this demand. And so when I see businesses that are actually speaking to policymakers um, and that are using their force, usually businesses will, uh, sorry, policymakers will be really, really excited to hear from business businesses in this way. So I would say if you are an entrepreneur, you can use your voice in that way, because um, a lot of the times they're saying like, we don't know if there's any interest in this, or we don't know how to support this. And what we saw with a piece of legislation that was just passed in BC last year is that um, there are, you know, there is like credible change that can happen and that can create this more stakeholder approach. It's just that we need to use our voices as business leaders to ask for that change. Great, thanks. Um, there's another question. So I'm combining two questions from Yasmin and Ian. Uh, when I think of B Corps, my mind immediately links to, to the to larger companies that are more established. Is it appropriate for small startup enterprises to consider the structure as aspirational, perhaps baked into a future iteration of a business model? And linked to that, are there guides for startup companies to uh, to 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 build themselves as a B Corp from the beginning? 
Yeah, for sure. So uh, the Be Impact Assessment, as I said, is available to anyone. So it's also helpful to go through it and answer aspirationally. So just understand what are the different impact areas your business can have and go through it that way. I also would suggest um, if you go to our website, bcorporation.net and click through on certification, there is a downloadable guide for small and medium sized businesses. And I would suggest implanting this in your business early because you're more nimble and you're able to put these policies on paper. As your company starts to scale, you're asking these questions from the beginning. And so I think that is a great time to begin. Um, sometimes it is harder for big companies, even though there can be kind of the, um, like the weight behind it from CEOs at a large company to push it through. Uh, at such a scale, it can be harder to make the changes. Whereas as you're starting to grow, by putting those policies right in place right from the beginning, you're able to, to do that. And we also offer a program called Pending B Corp. And so that's offered for any company that's been in operation for less than a year because there is a rigorous requirement around documentation of your operations and companies that have been in business for less than a year cannot meet those criteria. Um, we offer this pending B program, which is available to any company um, that's been in business for less than a year. So they can sort of use the IP around uh, their intention to become a B Corp. And that will um, be a way to, you know, show investors and show um, customers or future, you know, employees that this is the intention of how you're building your business. Great, thanks. And we uh, maybe we can follow up with our attendees with some of those links so that they can take a look at um, that pending B Corp program and then also that that uh, that assessment. Um, great. Uh, there's a question from Dan. What are the challenges and aspirations B Lab is currently focusing on as it attempts to further its mission? What kinds of partnerships do you foresee as being advantageous uh, or currently proving useful? Um, yeah, I would say that right now with um, both the COVID pandemic and with the racial justice movements, we've been working really specifically on um, worker practices. So how we can support companies in supporting their workers that have been hardest hit through the pandemic. Um, we know there have been layoffs across the board and things like that, um, as well as financial resilience of the companies. So linking them to funding opportunities or investment opportunities and tools to help manage their business. Um, and then from the ra racial justice perspective, um, this is something that we've been working on with partnerships over the years. I think um, we have uh, developed partnerships across the community for, for um, across those things like worker resilience, financial resilience, and um, racial justice, where we recognize as BLAB, we you know, focus on stakeholder capitalism. We're not necessarily um, subject matter experts in any of those things. And so that's where partnerships for us have been really useful. Um, you know, we are, uh, we are working on different ways that this can come about. And so, for example, I mentioned the Rhino Foods, um, their program around income advance. And so we partnered with them on getting that as a standalone website. So if you go to um, incomeadvance.org, it is a toolkit that any company can use. And so those are the kinds of partnerships that we'll engage in where we are providing business tools for companies that are looking to increase their impact um, and where we bring in sort of um, partners, nonprofits or for-profits that have either that subject matter expertise or the capacity to support us in that. Great, thank you, Kasha. Um, another question, uh, once a company becomes a B Corp, what, what criteria are they held accountable to exactly? And does that criteria change year to year? And how do you monitor and evaluate those improvements? Yeah, so once a company goes through the process, they have, um, they have requirements, those 200 questions, um, they have a requirement to meet the 80 point mark and get points um, based on questions that have to do with their governance. So that will measure things like um, whether they have a whistleblower policy in place, the transparency, um, and equity, like whether they have representation on their board of directors, things like that at the governance level. Um, they're also um, evaluated based on their worker structure. So things like your employee benefits, um, if you have an employee ownership structure, or if you have a flexible um, policy that helps new parents returning to the workplace, things like that. Um, the community aspect covers your supply chain as well as your community partnerships. Um, so, you know, if you have a code of conduct for your suppliers or whether you have a giving model or you have an intentional uh, practice around hiring from a marginalized community uh, close to your neighborhood or things like that. Um, environment is your pretty typical inputs and outputs and um, things like, you know, if you are in the regenerative agriculture space, things like that. 
and then your customer model, it, it will evaluate how you're providing a, a specific beneficial outcome to your customers. So we take a whole assessment of all of those things. We look at all of the documentation with regards to those pieces. And then from there, we update the assessment every three years and companies are required to recertify every three years. So in the interim, they can use the assessment as a way to track their goals. Um, but broadly, we check in with them every three years. And because the um, verification process is um, so rigorous, that's sort of where we've landed um, through consultation as kind of the safe uh, like place to check in with companies. Um, also to give them enough time, I think, to be able to work on those improvements. We used to recertify every two years. But for a lot of companies, it felt like because it's such a rigorous process, they were just getting to like through certification and it took them a number of months. And then they were already having to prepare for recertification. So we made it a three year process. Fantastic. Thank you. And um, we have one more question here. Uh, once, uh, sorry, um, uh, do, you, do you help those companies that maybe fail the, the, the tests or maybe that aren't up to the standard that you're looking for? Um, and it, in what ways might you support them? And there's a question also on the, the percentage of successful applicants you have. I don't know as a percentage, but <laughs> I think we have over 50,000 people that have taken the assessment and we have three and a half thousand companies. Okay. So yeah. that tells Absolutely. you something. It. It's a high bar. <laughs> <laughs> um, we, and I mean, that, that might be also companies that choose not to certify even if they've met the bar, but um, uh, because for some people, the legal uh, requirement is an impediment too. Um, we do help companies. So we have a number of resources on our website. We have um, resources around, you know, anything from in improving your justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion in initiatives to how to measure carbon footprint, things like that. Um, and so we have online resources. We also have, um, once you submit the assessment, if, you're, if, you, if you have gotten 80 points, but once you go through the verification and your score drops, um, the assistant, the analyst that's assisting you with the process will usually send through some resources or help point out areas of improvement to you. Um, and then we have a really great partnership with the Business Development Bank of Canada, BDC, and they host um, themselves, they host uh, B Corp 101 workshops. And so those are happening right now virtually, which is really great because you could obviously tune into one that's happening in BC or wherever, but they host them across the country. And the B Corp 101 sessions are usually about two hours. And the intention is to like sit down and go through the assessment together. So it's usually a small group of like maybe 15 or 20 people. And so there's enough time for um, the person who's leading the session to like really specifically focus on helping folks. Um, and so, yeah, there are kind of a number of ways that. I think those numbers are uh, uh, actually very reassuring to somebody like me. When I hear that that many people don't qualify, I think, good. That means <laughs> there's a real there's a real cachet uh, with actually becoming a B Corp, and uh, I think that's I think that's really actually quite reassuring. So yeah, sorry I interrupted. No, that that's great. Um, I mean, I I think we managed to get to most of the questions in the chat. So I guess the last thing would be, Kasha, is there anything that we might have missed, or anything that you wanted to share about before we wrap up? Um, just to celebrate the great B Corps that are at uh, CSI, I saw some of them coming through the chat, Grant Book, and Ecotone, uh, as well as Fix. I think um, I would just encourage folks to seek out B Corps wherever they can, because uh, as we said, you know, it is this stamp of um, assessment that really shows that the company is walking the talk. So uh, just, yeah, I would encourage companies to, or individuals to think about the companies they're buying from, doing business with, going to work for, because it all has an impact. Kasha, you've uh, you've provided just an amazing uh, amazing depth of knowledge around what B Corps uh, can do, are doing, and I think really inspired us all. So thank you, thank you so much. Thank you for uh, being here with us today, but also thank you more importantly for the work that you do. I have every confidence that no matter where you end up next, it'll be having more and more of an impact. And I feel like the future is in good hands. So yay! <laughs> thank you so much for uh, for being with us here today. It was my pleasure. Thank you for the platform.
Awesome. Thank you so much. And thanks to everyone who joined us today. We will follow up with some of those links that, that Kesha mentioned. Um, and also, we have posted a feedback form. We'd love to hear about your experience today. Uh, that's really helpful so we know how we can improve our events moving forward. Um, and we'll be in touch soon. We recorded the session, so we'll follow up with the YouTube link so you can rewatch the conversation again and send it along to your friends. So thanks, everyone. Thank and, you. Uh, We'll see you again soon for our next Economy Conversations. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thanks, Zoya. You're awesome.